thanks everyone for coming. I'm Peter Lillico. I'm a lawyer. Uh, my office is in Peterborough, Ontario, but I sort of specialize in cottage succession planning, so my clients are all over Ontario. Um, I have a couple of handouts, and there's, there's lots of them, so you don't need to rush. One with this pretty picture is really just my contact information, if you want that, although it will be shown on screen as well. And then, uh, although this is, uh, I partner with Cottage Life to do their Cottage Life Spring Show, the Cottage Life Fall Show, and then the Ottawa Show uh, throughout the year, and particularly in the summer, I partner with the Federation of Ontario Cottagers Association, and they do uh, a bunch of webinars, very occasionally in person, presentations again on cottage succession. So uh, they're all listed here. If anybody is a director of the Cottage Association or likes the kind of thing you hear today and would like to get more information for your, uh, for your neighbors on the lake, you can pick these up. They give an idea as to how that works and you would contact FOCA to do that. So my topic today, no surprise, top five cottage succession planning uh, mistakes. Um, how many people here own cottages already? And how many people are hoping that maybe at some point they, if they play their cards right, they'll inherit a cottage? So everybody's uh, sort of reading on the same page. How many people at the lake today noticed that there were for sale signs on your lake? Right, a lot. And I bet some of those were cottages maybe that had been in that same family for decades or maybe even for generations. And you got to scratch your head and say, well, gee, what happened? Uh, did, uh, did the cottage just turn out to be bad? Uh, did everybody decide they stopped hating or stopped liking the lake? Or uh, did everybody stop getting along together? And the answer to all of those things is probably no. The lake is probably just as nice this year as it was two years ago, and the kids are probably pretty much the same. Uh, and probably the difference is on some type of a transition, uh, typically perhaps the death of the parents and passing the cottage on to the next generation, there was a lack of succession planning. Succession planning is more than just uh, a will that says um, everything goes to all the kids, and that includes the cottage, even though some of the kids may not want the cottage and some of the kids may not be able to afford the cottage. So over the 44 years that I've been doing this, I've found most of, maybe not every one, I can always learn things, but I found most of the mistakes that are made uh, in passing the cottage from one generation to the next. And so my goal today is to share with you what those are so that you can be alert to them and avoid them and uh, do everything you can in your power to keep the cottage in your cottage, your family cottage in your family for the next generation or two. So, uh, as we're all aware, cottages have a large financial value. Um, particularly over the last several years, they've increased in value very substantially. For those of us that want to keep the cottage in the family, that's not even necessarily a good thing because as the cottage values go up on paper, so do the capital gains tax liabilities and your municipal taxes and other things, making it harder to transition to the next generation. It also uh, means that there's not really very many alternatives for the kids. How many of you have kids? How many of your kids could go out and buy a cottage next door to you or on the same lake? Right, very few. So the focus there is the cottage that's in your family now is probably the only cottage that there's ever going to be in your family. And if somehow that gets fumbled and somebody else comes along and buys it and now it's their family's cottage and your children and your grandchildren are probably never going to have that wonderful lake and cottage and waterfront experience that uh, clearly we all value so much. So most of the problems that arise isn't, isn't stupid people. It's, it's not kids that all of a sudden decide they can't get along or don't like the cottage. Many of the problems that lead to the loss of the cottage and the for sale signs going up is a, uh, is a consequence of parents well-intentioned having assumptions 
and they base their succession planning, whether it's formalized or otherwise, on those assumptions. And then, too late, it's discovered that those are flawed assumptions. It's from those things, some of which are tax-related, some of which are family-related, some of which are just things that you wouldn't necessarily think of. These are the things that cause those for sale signs to sprout in most cases. So, the best thing to do, the smart thing to do, is to identify at least some of those common mistakes and make darn sure that you don't include those in your own cottage succession planning. First assumption, and this one happens to be a capital gains tax one. Many people, including people I spoke to earlier today, are confused by the words principal residence. You're, you've heard of a principal residence exemption. The Income Tax Act creates that phrase, principal residence. It's a really misleading phrase because people think, gee, I spend nine months at home in, my, in the city and I spend three months at the cottage. So I guess my home must be my principal residence. And even though my cottage may be worth a lot more than my home, I don't want to get into trouble with Canada Revenue Agency and try to pretend that I spend more nights at the cottage water access <laughs> and unheated than I do at home. And so that is a flawed assumption because the principal residence exemption is much broader than you think. The principal residence exemption basically says a residential property owned by a Canadian and used or occupied by them or their family during a taxation year qualifies for the principal residence exemption. Now, several years ago, but at the same main stage, there was a chap at the end of it that uh, was sort of knocking his head, literally knocking his head. They had that time they had fake styrofoam beams that made it look very rustic. And at the end of the presentation, and this was one of the points I'd made at that presentation, he was literally knocking his head against the styrofoam. Now, I didn't think he was going to do too much injury to himself. But I was concerned, so I went over and asked him if he was okay. And he explained that uh, two years ago he'd retired, he'd sold his condo uh, in the GTA, and he'd moved to the Muskoka Lake Cottage that was his pride and joy. Um, not knowing any better, he'd used his principal residence exemption on his $500,000 condo, and then moved into his million-dollar cottage. And he now realized that he had maybe exempted $100,000 worth of capital gains taxes on the condo. And he had the option, if he'd known, to have reserved that and it would have been worth about $400,000 on the Muskoka cottage. Okay? So that's, that's a rather important point. Uh, as I was speaking to people earlier today, if you, how many people here own a home and a cottage? Okay, so my advice to you, you don't need to remember all the details, but if and when you're ready to sell the house, to, whether you're downsizing, whether you're moving to an apartment, whether you're moving to the cottage, whatever it is, if the time comes that you're going to sell the house, fine, go ahead and sell it. That's, that's not tricky. Between the date of you selling the house and April 30th the next year, you need to decide where best to use your principal residence exemption because you can only use it on one property at one time. So for the chap who had the Muskoka cottage, had he gone to his accountant sometime between May when he sold his condo and the following April to say, um, I need to uh, determine where to use my principal residence exemption, the accountant would simply say, well, what was the fair market value of the condo, 500000 What did you buy it for? 250000 Did you put any money into it? Not much. Okay. So we could exempt that, and we would be effectively exempting 40 odd thousand dollars worth of tax. That's what that would work out to. I think, nope, I was wrong. $250,000 worth of gain, uh, $125,000 added to income, maybe fifty, sixty thousand dollars worth of tax. That's what it would have been on that. On the Muskoka Cottage, 
what was it worth when you acquired it? Well, about 400000 And how much have you put into it? For, for illustration purposes, I'll say nothing, just to keep it the same as the house. What's it worth now? A million bucks. That's a $600,000 gain. $300,000 added to income, $150,000 paid in tax. So simply by not understanding that he was able to use a principal residence exemption on his cottage, it literally cost him $110,000 of after-tax money. That was the penalty. And he was kind of annoyed because there was a lot of other things he would have rather spent his $110,000 on on the cottage than just to give it to the government because he didn't know any better. So that's the first, and I see heads nodding, so maybe a lot of you already knew that, but that's the most important one to know is you do have choices between house or cottage as to where you qualify for principal residence. Uh, you also don't need to designate it, you know, here I am, I'll designate my cottage in 2023 and hope that it goes up more than my house does over the next eight years until I sell. You don't need to do it. You just use your uh, rear view mirror and say, well, I'll just get the values, I'll throw it to the accountant, they'll crunch it through the can tax program and they'll tell us literally to the dollar how much it's worth on one property, how much it's worth on the other, and then I'll make an informed decision as to what to do. So that's one that I hope you guys will never mistake. Now, another one also related to capital gains tax and also related to principal residence exemption is uh, sort of an old wives' tale. Lots of people think, fine, I will live in town and I'll have my house and my cottage, but I really don't like the big smoke and boy, as soon as I can retire, I'm going to sell in, in the big city and I'm going to move up to the cottage. And I will use my principal residence exemption on my house so I don't need to pay capital gains taxes on that. And then I'll move into the cottage and it will become my principal residence for tax purposes. And because it's my principal residence, I won't have to pay tax on that either. And that is a flawed assumption. That is a mistake. And I had just a year ago, I had an estate. I was working on an estate where that was the operating principle. And when the parents passed, they basically had very little money, but they had a very valuable cottage. But because they thought that it was principal residence exemption, uh, and then the kids found out when they spoke to the accountant, oh no, uh, in the last eight years of their life, when they had sold their house and lived in the cottage, the cottage qualified for the principal residence exemption. But the 22 years before that, when they'd lived in the house in town, they can only use the principal, they've already used the principal residence exemption for those years. And so there was a big whacking tax cost. And the kids didn't, there was no plan for that. There was no insurance on the parents' life. Everybody just assumed it would go to them free. And so that was one of the cottages that went for sale that year on that lake because the kids were facing something like a $210,000 tax bill and the, the brother and the sister didn't have it and they weren't in a position that they could put mortgages on the cottage and so that cottage was sold because of that flawed assumption. So that was the assumption. I probably already tipped my hand on that. The cottage does qualify for principal residence exemption only from that point forward, but that doesn't magically make the last 20 years of capital gains taxes on the cottage go away. It just starts to help going forward. So the next question that people are going to ask is, well, you know, if, if, it's, if it was 20 years as not principal residence because I lived in a home and I used that for that, and then the last 10 years it was uh, a principal residence, how does Canada Revenue tax me? And they have a formula and it can kind of hurt your head. So anybody here that wants to know more about this is most welcome to email me and I will send it to you in writing and you can get your cup of tea and sit down and try to figure out uh, how it works. But effectively what they do is they say, you owned that cottage 30 years. 20 years of that wasn't principal residence. We know it wasn't because you used your principal residence exemption to that point. The last 10 years, it qualified for the principal residence exemption. So we have a fraction, back to grade school, 10 over 30. The 10 years that it was qualifying for principal residence over the whole 30 years that you owned it. So effectively, one third is capital gains tax exempt and two thirds is taxable. 
So they take the total capital gain over that 30-year period of time, knock off a third and say, well, that was exempt, but then the other 20 is, is taxable. Now, if you use the numbers differently, let's say you bought a house and a cottage at the same time 10 years ago, and then you sold the house and moved to the cottage. So at that point, it's a total of, uh, uh, at 10 years later, it's a total of 20 years that they've owned the cottage, 10 years of which is exempt, and in effect, uh, 10 years is taxable, so half of it's exempt from tax. The next year it's going to be 11 over 21, and then it's going to be 12 over 22. And if you can do that in your head, you'll see every year that fraction starts to work in our benefit. A fraction more is on the tax-exempt side, and a fraction less is on the taxable side. I don't expect you to memorize that. If you want it, you know, I'll send it out to you. The important part is do not fall into the planning trap thinking that simply because it qualifies the year before you died or five years before you died that it's now a completely exempt property. It's not. It will always carry some tail of capital gains tax. The longer you live and the more uh, time that it's principal residence, the less of the percentage that's going to be taxable and the more that's going to be uh, tax-free. So now I'm moving from the principal residence capital gains tax exemptions. And I, I've picked these because these are ones that, you know, in my experience, in real life experience, I've seen result in the loss of cottages. Here's one that's a family oriented one. Um, there's the parents. And they love the kids. And the kids love the cottage. So their succession plan is, well, we'll just leave it to the kids. We'll leave it to all the kids. And in so doing, they are missing a big point. Some kids may be less interested in the cottage than others. Some kids may be less able to afford carrying their own house and a third of the cottage costs. Um, and some kids may not want to share cottage ownership. They, might, they may like the cottage. And so the result there is a year or two after the cottage is transferred out of the parents to the kids, these internal uh, dynamics come to play. Somebody that says, look, I, what were mom and dad thinking? I live in Alberta. Why would I, they think that I'd want a third of the cottage? I love it. I, you know, I'd like to come and visit there, but I, I, I'm not even using it. Maybe once every two years I'll get to use it for a week. And yet I'm expected because I'm a one-third owner to be, in effect, subsidizing my Ontario siblings, that's a problem. That person's at some point going to say, well, either I don't want to pay or I want you to buy me out. And that can lead to difficulties and hard feelings in itself. Or there may be a kid that says, uh, what were mom and dad thinking? Um, the, uh, my brother and my sister, they've got lots of money and I don't have much money. Uh, we use the cottage the same. Uh, we know cottages aren't inexpensive to, uh, to keep, and I just don't have that money. And so what do I do? Uh, I, I, can't, I can't come up with my one-third of the payments for the year, and that makes me feel guilty. And so the taxes still need to be paid, so the, the siblings pay it for me, and that kind of makes them resentful. And is this a happy cottage, or is this a bone of contention? So these are predictable things, right? Um, so one of the, the point that I'm clumsily trying to make here is this is a false assumption. The kids may be great, but they may not all be equally suited for shared cottage ownership. And so you need to objectively, as parents, try to assess some of these issues, not, not to exclude children, not to say, oh, cottage will only go to the rich kids or something like that, but to try to anticipate some of these problems and build them into your cottage succession plan. Because it's not a successful cottage succession plan, ladies and gentlemen, if it's a bone of contention for a couple of years and then it's sold because you weren't, you just had rose-tinted glasses on and said, my will says everything goes to my spouse and when my spouse is gone, everything goes to the kids. And they're, they're good kids, they'll figure it out. Well. They may figure it out, but it may be at the cost of that family cottage, and then your grandchildren will never have a cottage to go to. So I have a, um, a worksheet that I can provide people if you wish to email me, and it's called Choosing Children Worksheet. 
and it focuses on the six characteristics here, and you can actually, you know, add values to these to try to determine, even though every kid is 10 out of 10 on I love them scale, are they 10 out of 10 on the are they suitable for shared cottage ownership scale? And these are the types of things we need to consider. The enthusiasm that the kids have for owning the cottage. Uh, if you ask your kid, you got to be careful to ask, you got to speak to the kids, you, you got to ask them the right question. If you say, hey, do you like the cottage? They're probably going to say, yeah, we, we really like the cottage, we enjoy coming up here. The question that you need to be asking them is, uh, are you prepared to be an owner of the cottage where all the costs are going to come out of your pocket and all the work is going to come out of your back? And then you might find sometimes one of the kids says, well, you know, mom and dad, I do love coming to the cottage, but what I love is mom and dad and sharing your company. And dad's got the boat running and the water system going and mom's got the fridge filled and she's got the beds all made. And what a wonderful vacation that is. And it's cheaper than Airbnb, right? And they may go on to say, however, uh, you know, it's a four hour drive from Sarnia up in black fly season, and once you're gone, guys, you know, we just may not be as interested in, in, in doing that anymore. Well, that's a great thing to hear from the kids. You don't, you, know, you don't sulk or pout. You say, thanks for telling us that. You may just have saved the cottage, because up until this point, your will may just say everything goes to all the kids. And that's going to build up one of these dynamics that six months, six weeks, six years, whatever, is going to be a time bomb that is going to blow up in the faces of the kids to the detriment of their relationship and the loss of the cottage for the grandchildren. If we know ahead of time that you don't want to be included in cottage ownership, no problem. We'll go to our clever lawyer. We will work out a different succession plan. We will um, make sure that the cottage goes to those kids who have enthusiasm about owning it and we will find a way to compensate you. We'll probably give you more cash just because, you know, we're, uh, you know, we love you all equally, so we're going to make it work, but not work by you guys, uh, I don't know, battling away at each other with paddles behind the boathouse. So there's ownership enthusiasm, usage expectations. Um, you may have three kids. You probably don't have three cottages to leave a cottage to each of the kids. So if you're going to keep the cottage in the family, it's probably going to be through some kind of a shared ownership structure. And that raises another issue. Uh, now the dynamic is probably, gee, we like to come up to the cottage as often as we can. We'll give mom and dad a call, make sure it's not inconvenient for them, and then, you know, we're coming up there. So the usage expectations is basically whenever mom and dad say we can right? Or, or always unless mom and dad say we can't, something like that. But when there's two or three family members, can it be a free for all? You know, is it, is it first arrived gets the cottage, everybody, the next group gets the bunkie and the next ones get the tents? You know, that, that's going to cause problems too. Uh, uh, I live in Peterborough. Uh, our family cottage initially was on Shimong Lake. It would take me 15 minutes to get there, you know. I could work late and still be at the cottage at 5.45 and my sister, who lived in Timmins, <laughs> could be up at the break of dawn <laughs> driving all day and she'd be in the bunkie again. So uh, you need to, with the, with the kids, work out what is their usage expectations. Do they all feel that they have to use it all the time? Um, uh, are they prepared to take turns? We'll generally share it because we like our siblings, but there could be times when I'd like to have it for a week so I can bring up my kids, my teenage kids, they can bring up some of their friends. I wouldn't think of inflicting them on the rest of the family, but, you know, let me have a week and then, you know, in return you can have a week of exclusive usage for you and your rowdy jet ski buddies and your cases of beer. And, and So these are the types of things they don't need to become problems if you can anticipate ahead of time and largely discussing with the kids too into saying, okay, you're prepared to share ownership, uh, you have different uses expectations, we're going to have to work out some way in which these aren't going to be arm wrestling all the time or causing resentment all the time. Uh, financial capabilities are one of them. 
How many cottages come free? Right. I was just making sure you were awake there. So they cost money. And uh, all the kids may be equally nice, but do they all have equally deep pockets? And if after inheriting the cottage, does that old septic system pack it in itself in and it turns out it's going to be $18,000 to replace the septic system? And one of the kids might say, oh, I've got $6,000 sitting in my back pocket. Here it is. I've paid my share. And another kid might say, oh, I don't have it in my back pocket, but, you know, give me a week or 10 days, I'll, I'll get it. It's important to kind of be able to flush a toilet. And one of the kids might say, I don't have $6,000. I'd have to sell my car to get $6,000, and then I couldn't get to work. I, I, I can't come up with the money. Now, that's good to know. I mean, when you look at your kids, you're not assessing their value in the sense of, you know, what, how much money they make. But if they're sharing ownership of a cottage, you need to consider that. And again, if you do consider it, there are things that we can do to what I call equalizing the playing field. So if you look at this realistically and say, you know, two of them are doing pretty well, another one is struggling, and who knows, maybe that late bloomer will catch on fire and invent the new electric car charging battery system or something like that and uh, buy the cottages next door and have a family compound, but that's not what we can count on. What we need to count on is there may well be difficulties in all of them coming up with the same amount of money at the same time. So what can we do about that? You build it into your cottage succession plan. And an obvious way, there's actually multiple ways. Every difficulty, ladies and gentlemen, that I come up with, I promise you there's one or two or three successful solutions to them if they're recognized ahead of time and provided for ahead of time. So an obvious one in that circumstance is when the parents say, okay, um, three kids say they want it, they say they really want it, they say they'll share ownership, we'll share usage, we'll get all of those things, but we can't just say we'll share $18,000 if not all of them have their 6000 bucks. So we could, in our cottage succession plan, say in the will, the cottage goes to the three kids, and along with that goes $60,000 to be paid, say, out of the house sale proceeds, because I won't be won't be needed anymore because I'm six feet under and, and I got a different, I got a grass roof now. So, how does that 60 grand work? Well, it's to be used exclusively for cottage purposes. Uh, it'll produce, you know, a couple of grand of money if you put it in, a, in an investment. Maybe that'll go towards the insurance and reduce the annual cost, but that's not what it's really there for. It's really there for a strategic reserve. If a windstorm comes along and blows the roof off, right, then guess what, the insurance doesn't cover it all, or the septic system packs it in, or some major repairs need to be done, or there's a wish to, you know, two out of three really want to put on an addition, so we've got an extra couple of bunk beds or something like that, then you can try and pass the hat, as everybody got the six grand, but if not, it's no longer a problem. Mom and dad were so smart, they left us a $60,000 reserve, We'll pull the $18,000 out of that. That's exactly what it's there for. We, we'll get the plumber in the next day. It'll all be repaired. We'll all feel good about ourselves. And maybe what we'll do is uh, every year, we'll each contribute whatever, an extra $1,000 towards over and above the operating costs, and we'll try to build that up uh, to the initial $60,000 because sooner or later, if not in our lifetime, in the grandkids' lifetime, there's going to be another issue like that. Um, rolling up their sleeves. By that, I'm referring to uh, the, the physical tasks that go along with cottages, whether it's putting, the, uh, putting the, the foot valve out in the middle of the lake, pushing all the ice cubes aside, and, and, or putting the docks in, or getting up on the roof in the winter to you know, uh, shovel off the snow load, whatever it might be. We know there's lots of work involved with cottages. Are all the kids equally able to contribute to the tasks? And the answer to that may be no. You know, we got one kid that lives in Windsor, we got another kid that lives half an hour from the cottage. Which is the one that's going to be more responsible for opening and closing and if there's a leaking tap, getting it fixed and that type of thing? And so that again can create disparities, right? Somebody feels, oh, geez, I'm doing all the work, you know, and then my sister rolls in and she, you know, she says, gee, thanks for making sure that the toilet is working and thanks for, you know, uh, fixing the pressure pump and all of these kinds of things. And again, these can create 
I won't say frictions, people will be understanding, but if it's too much, too many years in a row, there's going to be some frictions that way. So you can think about that. And in the example that I'm thinking about, where the daughter was the one that lived in Windsor, and if anybody bled true cottage blood, it was her, you know. And, uh, and the son lived pretty close, and he was pretty handy, so he ended up doing the lion's share of the work that was involved in the cottage. And she felt quite badly about this. She, she felt she wasn't pulling her share. She felt that the brother was going to be resentful about uh, having to do all the work while she, while she didn't contribute. So they worked it out with a little bit of nudging from me, and effectively what happened was she took over all the administration aspects of the cottage. When the insurance notice came in, she shopped the market every year for insurance. She tried to get the best possible deal on the insurance. When a notice of assessment came in that raised the, uh, the value for uh, tax purposes by 15%, she appealed it and went through the paperwork. Uh, when there were projects that needed to be done, a new dock to be built in, they both agreed on that. She was the one that would cost it out and get it all figured out. She felt happy as a clam. She was really contributing and doing something of value. And the brother was very happy that he didn't have to do that either because as he told me when they left the office, you know, she was worried about me being resentful. Really, I like going up to the cottage. It's peaceful and quiet. I can putter around. I can do things. It's just great. I'd have paid her if she'd asked me. So, in any case, but you can see my point there that in assessing how suitable a kid is for ownership, uh, part of it is the responsibilities. That's going to be affected by geography. It could be affected by skill. You know, give me a hammer and I'll ask, have to ask, you know, which way do I hold it? You know, whereas my brother can pull out a chainsaw and he can, you know, he can make trim. So these kinds of things count. None of these things disqualify somebody from being a cottage owner. All of them are relevant in deciding how we're going to come up with a cottage succession plan that isn't doomed to failure. Uh, playing together nicely is uh, something that's very difficult for, so cooperation is, is something that's difficult for the parents to uh, assess sometimes. They can say, well, you know, there's always been some sibling rivalries and uh, every now and then they'll complain that so-and-so was always the favorite and got the best treatment. Um, but, you know, often in families, if you've got three kids, there will be one, maybe it's the older sister who's always used to bossing the younger brothers around and, and getting her own way. And then when it comes to things like, uh, how are we going to uh, compromise on usage, she'll say, well, here's how it's going to be. And the two brothers are saying, well, geez, we've got it's just as much our cottage as hers. Why should we have to do what she says? Is she capable of compromising? These are questions that need to be considered by the parents. Uh, the next point that I'm going to make is going to be talking about a document called a cottage sharing agreement, which addresses some of these things. And this stage, though, is basically just saying, how do we choose the children? How do we make sure we've got the right mix of children? How do we make sure that we're not leaving the cottage as a burden and a problem for one kid or saddling the other ones with, uh, with issues that we could have foreseen, uh, financial issues that, uh, for example, or usage issues that we could resolve ahead of time. The last point I call risky business. And risky business here means by making a child an owner of a cottage, are we exposing the cottage, the cottage to risks? And the risk that I'm talking about isn't that, you know, you might get careless and, uh, you know, run into a log with the boat. I'm talking about risks that could actually lose the cottage. Is there a son that's on his third marriage? And we're not too sure about this current daughter-in-law. If so, 39 out of 100 marriages in, uh, in Canada and in separation or divorce. If he is an owner of a beautiful cottage, I guarantee if that marriage breaks down, her divorce lawyer is going to say, oh, you own one third of a beautiful $900,000 cottage. It, for Ontario Family Law Act purposes, qualifies as a matrimonial home. You have a $300,000 paper interest in that. We demand $150,000 of cash money to equalize that under the Family Law Act. We're entitled to it. So what does that guy do? His life's difficult. He goes to his siblings to say, look, life is really tough. I, 
you know, the, the house has to be sold and, and there won't be that much money left after the mortgage and there's $150,000 extra that I've got to come up with out of nowhere to, uh, to pay out my ex and uh, uh, will you guys please buy me out? I'm sorry, it breaks my heart, but will you buy me out? And the siblings will say, look, we're sympathetic, but we don't have $150,000 sitting in our pocket. And so the answer is no, we'll, you know, we realize you're having tough times. If you want us to, you know, give you a pause on, you know, payment of some of the payments, we'll do that. But we're not going to just dig into our own pockets, mortgage our own houses for $150,000 at this point in our life. So now that guy goes back to his lawyer, because he's got a lawyer, he's being sued for divorce, remember? And says, look, you told me to, you know, uh, you told me I had to pay $150,000 because I owned the cottage. You recommended to see if the siblings would buy me out. They've turned me down flat. Where do we go from here? And the lawyer will say, you do not have a legal problem. You have a family problem. Because in Ontario, there's a law called the Partition Act. And the Partition Act is a short act. And it basically says anyone with a property interest in Ontario is entitled to apply to a judge for a court-ordered sale of that property to free their money out of it. Okay? This isn't majority rules. This is a right that everybody, if I had one-sixth of a cottage, I'm entitled by law in the province of Ontario to apply for a judge. Judge will say, do you own a piece of property? Yep, here's the deed, judge. Look, I'm a one-sixth owner. I'm a one-third owner, whatever it might be. Here's the Partition Act. You have a right to a court-ordered sale. Let's start talking about the sale terms. Okay? I have answers for you for this. We can avoid these problems for your family. Please don't worry about them. But if there's a kid at risk, we need to start building in some protections that would ensure that a divorce among one of our three kids isn't going to lead to the forced sale of a cottage. And there's a couple of ways that I can help you with that. Um, so it could be a, a marriage breakdown. It could be uh, somebody that's got creditors, somebody that goes bankrupt. How many people that had very successful restaurant businesses in 2019 ended up going bankrupt in 2020 or 2021, not because they were bad, you know, or the change in the value of the Chinese yen, or I don't know, Mr. Putin deciding that he wants the nickel out of Sudbury or something like that. Things can happen. That wasn't that good a joke. So these are the factors that need to be considered. You all need to consider them. You need to consider them more than just kids are nice, kids are nice, kids are nice, they'll work it out. Uh, if you want that choosing children worksheet, let me know and it'll allow you to sort it out. And by sorting it out, you're not excluding a kid and saying, oh, this kid scored less than this one, so I guess the lower scoring one won't be a cottage owner. It means we have to identify why that kid scored low. And if it's something like just won't cooperate, it's my way or the highway, well, we may need a different succession plan. We may need the two that will cooperate and will do whatever it takes to keep the cottage in the family to be the cottage owners, and the one that says, I won't cooperate with the others uh, to have usage but not ownership and not a vote in how things happen because they've, they've shown us that they're not going to cooperate together or that they won't all cooperate together. Okay. Here's another assumption. This is the parents with their rose-tinted glasses. All the kids are nice. They all get along, and they'll all agree on everything. How many of your children always agree on everything all of the time? Right, they don't. And so no matter how well-intentioned the kids are, no matter how cooperative they are willing to be, I promise you there will be issues that arise over the 20 or 30 or 40 years that they own the cottage. And I will tell you, probably 95 of those issues they will be able to, well, 90% of them they probably agree. We agree, a new dock is needed, you know, so let's agree. Now we'll just decide when the dock will be built and what kind of dock. And another five, there'll be ones where you say, eh, I don't know, but we can compromise. We'll flip a coin, we'll find some way to do it. But there will be, I promise you, ladies and gentlemen, there will be issues if there's shared ownership that start out as differences of opinion and can escalate to disputes. And some of those disputes will end with for sale signs on the cottage and others will just be that the cottage is a bone of contention instead of this, you know, loving legacy. And so a cottage sharing agreement is kind of an essential part of an overall cottage succession plan. So at this stage, 
you know, we figured out some of the capital gains tax things and we, we, we got a handle on, we're not going to fall into some of those principal residence traps. Uh, we've done our own assessment about the children and to see who's viable and not viable. We put questions to the kids to say, you know, are, do, do you want to do you want to be an owner? Do you want to be just a visitor? Uh, if you want to be an owner, are you prepared to be a shared owner? If you're a shared owner, will you, uh, will you agree to share expenses and responsibilities? So, so far you're ticking off all the boxes and getting nothing but green lights. So at this point you say, okay kids, the devil's in the details. It's time to work out a cottage sharing agreement. You are eventually going to be owning the cottage and sharing ownership of the cottage. We need to start addressing some of these issues sooner rather than later. Uh, what does it do? It restricts transfers outside the family. So if one family member gets miffed, they can't say, well, I'm going to sell to the neighbor. He's always coveted our beach, right? Because the cottage sharing agreement will say in a legally effective manner, nobody can sell outside the family, perhaps without offering it to the others first or at a discounted value or however they think is fair. Um, a subset of that is uh, what happens if the cottage-owning child dies with a surviving spouse? Your kids probably have wills that's just like yours that say, when I'm gone, everything goes to the spouse. Without anything else, that means the third of the cottage is going to go to the spouse, who may be perfectly nice, but also may be so nice they end up getting remarried, and then your third of the cottage, of your family cottage, now becomes some other stranger families, and maybe they don't want it and apply to sell it, or maybe they show up with all of their cases of beer and their motorcycle gang buddies and no longer have a cottage that way either. So, restrictions on transfer outside of the, uh, the family. Importantly, have dispute resolution. Um, usually, this will be a fairly sophisticated dispute resolution system. People will say, let's say there's three kids because it's easier for illustration for me, but it works with two or four or whatever. We have dispute resolution that says um, most operational cottage decisions can be made on a majority rule basis. Everybody agrees there should be a dock. I think it should be a 50-foot dock because I got a 50-foot boat. You think it should be a 10-foot dock because all you've got is a kayak, right? So where do we go from here? If it's just equal votes, you know, we don't go anywhere. But if it's majority rules and uh, uh, two out of three say it should be a 30-foot dock, then, well, I guess I'm just SOL on the last 20 feet of that dock. I'll have to deal with that on my own. But it's resolved, and it's resolved without heat or friction because I agreed eight years ago that for these kind of decisions, majority would, would apply. Now, um, the kids themselves, with your assistance, will populate what I call fundamental decisions. These ones are, that are so important that you think it should be unanimous agreement. The sale of the cottage, the sale of a part of the property of the cottage, knocking down grandpa's old cottage and putting up a new one, uh, a major addition that might cost $100,000 or $200,000. The kids themselves will find their comfort levels to say, yeah, you know, majority rules for most things and I'll suck it up if, if a satellite dish has to go in that I don't want. But as far as, you know, uh, having to sign on to another mortgage or to uh, uh, involve some fourth person that I don't like in cottage ownership. Nope, I want to have a veto over that. Um, uh, there will be exit strategies. I sort of mentioned one. It might be as simple as a right of first refusal. Uh, there are other more sophisticated ones as well, but the kids will agree that they're fair. If, if my job leads me to Vancouver and I say, siblings, I just won't be able to come back to Ontario anymore, um, uh, will you please buy me out? The cottage sharing agreement will have an exit strategy and that exit strategy may say I get bought out and it may say I get bought out at a discount and it may say they can pay me out over years. They're, they, whatever they think is fair will be in there. They're not going to feel put upon because they agreed to it and I may not get every dire nickel out of it but then that's okay. I didn't pay anything for it but I, I get to extricate some of my money to be part of a down payment on a used garage in Vancouver. Uh, another thing, importantly, that will be in the cottage sharing agreement is a little clause, typically numbered paragraph 18 in my documents, that says, we all agree that we will never apply under the Partition Act. 
right? And so they have contractually given up their right. The, the law says you've got a right, but if you've signed off on that, that's a pretty short lawsuit. Judge, I'm applying the Partition Act. I want that cottage sold. Wait a minute, Judge. He signed a document here that said that he wouldn't do this. Judge looks and says, is that your signature? Yep. Case dismissed. Okay. And there's a responsible exit strategy to deal with it. So it doesn't even go to court. Okay. Now, this is one of the most important ones. Um, many parents think that they have succeeded in their succession plan when ownership passes to the next generation, typically by the registration of a deed with the kids' names on it. How successful was that succession plan if the next year a for sale sign goes up because of a divorce? Or two years later, uh, the trustee in bankruptcy takes over one third of it and again forces a sale. That's not a successful succession plan. We want that to be there for the grandkids. And there are things we can do about that. Risk of loss, family claims, creditors, divorcing in-laws, bankruptcy. Those are the external threats, right? The internal threat is family disagreements or differences of opinion which should be resolved by a cottage sharing agreement that was done 10 years before the parents passed away that says how we're going to resolve those things without litigation and without uh, broken arms and, and hard feelings. So these are the external threats, the divorcing in-law, the, the creditor problem, the, uh, the bankruptcy. So parents should provide lasting protection and I'm a big proponent of an ownership structure called a sprinkling cottage trust. And even when I speak to lawyers about cottage trusts, their eyes start to glaze over because they're kind of complicated things. So I'm just going to give you the high points of why I think this is a great ownership structure, whether you've got one kid that's going to be owning it or whether there's going to be four kids. You hire a lawyer that knows what he or she is doing to create a sprinkling cottage trust. It's eight pages long. Uh, it has a lot of advantages. When the kids become owners, they become trustees of this cottage trust. As trustees, they're in full control of it. They do whatever they want. They build a dock. They uh, allocate expenses. They do whatever they want. They're in full control. It's not like a trust company. This is, they are in full control as trustees. But there are three big advantages from having this trust structure. So instead of uh, Adam and Billy and Carla, as the owners in their personal names. It's Adam and Billy and Carla as trustees. That's what the deed is gonna show. And the first advantage of ownership in a sprinkling cottage trust is asset protection for up to 21 years after the kids inherit. And asset protection in this context means uh, if one of those three kids eight years after you've passed or passed the cottage on to the kids, if they have a divorce, and that divorce lawyer says, oh, matrimonial home, we're making a claim against it with all of the consequences that can flow from that. The answer is the case of Spencer versus Reesbury decided by the Ontario Court of Appeal in 2012 that says very expressly, if the cottage ownership is in this type of a structure, the cottage does not qualify for a matrimonial home pursuant to the Ontario Family Law Act and therefore is completely exempt from claims for equalization of net family assets. Slam dunk. Been there for whatever that is, 11 years, never been appealed. It's a complete barrier against any in-law problem. I know you all love your in-laws and you wouldn't think that any of them would cause a problem, but you, none of us can predict what's gonna happen to somebody else's marriage six years after we passed away but the Sprinkling Cottage Trust will be there to say if something bad does happen to any of those three on a marital grounds, it will not affect the cottage. It will be a personal tragedy. They'll deal with their pension, they'll deal with the house, but the cottage will still be there for the kids and for the grandkids. The Sprinkling Cottage Trust is an asset protection trust not only against marital claims, marital breakdown claims, but also against creditors no execution can go on from a bank that's calling a loan against a cottage that's held in this type of a trust. It just can't. And similarly, even if a kid goes bankrupt, well, they're going to lose their house, they're going to lose their bank account, they're going to lose their car, it will not affect the cottage. 
So we all hope that none of our kids have a cloud on their marital horizon. We hope all, none of our kids have financial problems, but we don't know that. What we know is we want the cottage to be there for the grandkids, and so having 21 years of absolute bulletproof protection against any of those risks probably quadruples the chances that it's going to be there for the grandkids in due course. But that's just one of the advantages. The second advantage is it's unless the cottage has always been your principal residence, when you pass it on to your kids during your lifetime or in your will, there will be capital gains taxes. And given the increase in value over the period of time, it may be a significant capital gains tax. Think of what your cottage was worth 20 years ago. And think of what it's worth now. Would you have thought 20 years ago that your cottage, if somebody said, oh, you, you know, your cottage is going to be worth that? Probably not. So typically over 20 years, that cottage probably tripled in value. Anybody saying I'm way off with that? So think of that and then think in another 20 years. So 20 years after your kids inherit, what was a million dollar cottage is now a $3 million cottage. And what was maybe $150,000 in capital gains would be $720,000 in capital gains. And where does that money come from? So the good news here is, another characteristic of the Sprinkling Cottage Trust is, your kids have the option to pass their third of the cottage on to their kids without paying capital gains taxes. I know, sounds too good to be true, and it, it won't apply to everybody, right? Somebody might have a kid that uh, isn't interested in the cottage. Somebody might have a kid that lives in Australia. But the option is there. One of the legacies that we're leaving the kids is a break on passing the cottage down from generation to generation without capital gains taxes, right? If you don't have a sprinkling cottage trust when you put the cottage into their name, then they won't be able to take advantage of that. The final benefit is flexibility. Um, right now you might have three kids and six grandkids, and who knows, the grandkids are teenagers. And so you might say, well, why don't I skip a generation just by leaving it over the kids and to the grandkids? That's fun. Well, I don't know, you've got six teenagers. How many of those six teenagers are going to be interested in the cottage? Not all of them. How many of them are going to be able to afford the cottage? Not all of them. You know, how many of them are going to be able to get along with the others? Not all of them. How many are going to live in Ontario? Not all of them. And so that's lighting the fuse on a time bomb. You're just assuming that all six kids, all six grandkids are going to be owners uh, to save some capital gains taxes. Uh, but you guessed wrong. Only four want the cottage and the other two want to be paid out immediately. So it falls apart. But with the Sprinkling Cottage Trust, your kids, 21 years after you passed, when those 18-year-olds are now 39-year-olds, they can decide. Not this grandkid living in Australia. Not this kid that says, I don't want it. These four kids that say they'll do anything that it takes to keep the cottage in the family, they will be the ones that will inherit under the cottage. Sorry, they will inherit the cottage from the Sprinkling Cottage Trust. And if there's a kid that doesn't have any kids, still not a disaster. The flexibility of this Sprinkling Cottage Trust says, okay, you're going to leave yours to your kids, you're going to leave yours to your kids, I don't have any kids, I'll just take my one-third out, and uh, there's no capital gains tax. We know the cottage has gone up greatly in value over that 20 years, but by bringing the, my interest of the cottage out to me, that's not a taxable disposition, that's a tax-deferred distribution from a trust, and so I won't pay capital gains taxes till I die, and I got life insurance, so I'm not worried. I mean, I'll leave it to my nieces and nephews. So the last part about this is, some of you may be thinking, well, why don't we do this? Why doesn't everybody do this? Well, not everybody knows about Sprinkling Cottage Trust. Not every lawyer is going to know about these. These are pretty sophisticated things, but they really work. To me, they are the better mousetrap. So how can you provide this protection? Well, you can do it during your lifetime. If the time comes when you're saying, uh, kids want the cottage, we put them to the test, they've got a cottage sharing agreement, I'm 89 years old, I'm done with the cottage, I'm ready to pass it over to them, I've figured out the capital gains tax aspect of it, so I'm going to hand it over to them. Uh, but instead of just putting um, Andrew, Billy and Carla's names, I'm going to put Andrew, Billy and Carla's names in trust and I'll pay the lawyer to do the Sprinkling Cottage Trust and 
then they will have the 21 years worth of asset protection as well as that generation skipping for capital gains taxes. So some of you here, that will be the solution. My guess is 20% of you will end up transferring ownership during your lifetime because it'll just be the right way for your family. But most of you, it will be upon death. And so that will typically be uh, in your will that says, uh, uh, upon my death, uh, everything goes to my spouse. When the spouse dies too, uh, everything goes to the kids. But if there's still a cottage, it goes into this sprinkling cottage trust. And all three kids will be the trustees. Yep, some capital gains taxes will have to be paid out of my house sale proceeds, but then it's done. And it's done for their generation, and it might even be done for the next generation. And for 21 years afterwards, if that darn son-in-law ends up being a pill or, or the, the bank loans get called over there, it at least won't affect the cottage. And last but not least on this, and I, I'm going to go to questions rather than get into this more detail, most people use wills to pass assets on to their kids. Wills typically have to be probated. Probate taxes are fairly expensive, not as much as capital gains taxes, but it's $15 per thousand, so on a million dollar cottage, that's 15 grand. And on a million dollar house, that's another 15 grand. So it can get up into tens of thousands of dollars, but even more troublesome, it's a court process. It can take three months, six months, nine months to work this through the courts. And during that period of time, the kids can't deal with the cottage, they can't sell the house, and they won't be able to access the investments. But if you use a joint partner trust as your transfer vehicle, there is no application of probate, there is no probate tax, and they can list the house for sale the day after the funeral if they want. Again, if you guys are interested in some of these things, if you're interested in a cottage sharing agreement, email me. I will send you more information on the benefits and the process. If you're interested in the joint partner trust, which I should say is restricted, it's such a cool thing, it's restricted only to Canadian residents over age 65, right? So that's not for everybody, uh, but if it's available and you can save tens of thousands of dollars in probate tax and six months of state administration, you might consider that of value as well. So. Peter, uh, thank you very much. That was an excellent presentation. Um, does, I, I know there's a lot of information that's been covered here and, and Peter is, uh, is accessible and you can email him or call him um, for more specifics if you do want to go forward. But are there any general questions that anyone has that, that may be some issues that weren't covered here? The, uh, can you do the, uh, the uh, Sprinkling Cottage Trust, can you do that with one person? Or? Yes. So, so the question is, so the Sprinkling Cottage Trust is for the next generation of owners, whether it's your only kid or whether it's all three kids, it's equally applicable. The one kid that own it, owns it uh, is exempt from claims on separation or divorce, they can pass it on to their kids. Anybody leaving a cottage to another generation should have the Sprinkling Cottage Trust in my opinion. Now only those that have two or three kids that they're leaving the cottage need to worry about a cottage sharing agreement. Um, we have a question that someone submitted online. It's from Sandy. Uh, we built our cottage in 2010 and have lost the receipts for the building costs. Are we on the hook for all capital gains when we sell the cottage? Okay, so that's a good question and it's a common question. Um, sadly, I have to tell you a little bit about capital gains. Anytime you, th and, but anytime you do cottage succession planning, we've got to do a, uh, at least a, a run through on capital gains tax to see how it's going to apply to your situation. Will it be completely exempt because it's always been your principal residence or will there be a tax? But basically, everybody has a cost base. That's the cost that you paid for it when you bought the cottage or you bought the land and you built on it. Then there's what are called uh, capital improvements, which is knocking down the old cottage, building a new cottage or putting in a new road or putting in a new roof or putting in a new water system. Things that you do to improve the cottage it's not paying the municipal taxes, it's things that improve the cottage. Those increase the cost base, and that's something called an adjusted cost base. And then to figure out what the capital gains tax is, you can find out what the fair market value is, and you subtract the adjusted cost base. Again, I've got a handout for this if people want it. Sandy's question relates to 
gee, I did capital improvements, but I don't have receipts for everything. Can I still claim them? And the answer is yes. Of course, if Canada Revenue says, ah, you say you spent $10,000 on a dock, uh, prove it. Well, the easiest way is, well, here's the contractor's bill, marked paid, okay? But if there isn't such a thing, if you've mislaid it, or if the Doug and Doug and his other brother Doug that helped you build it had to be paid in cash and wouldn't give a written receipt, you can still prove it. Look, government, there's a dock. It's 30 feet long. I'll give you an affidavit from a builder that says what a 30-foot dock cost back in, you know, 2012, and there's some evidence, but you can't deny there's a dock. You might quibble about is it a $9,000 dock or an $8,000 dock, but they can't deny there's a dock. So my advice to clients like Sandy is claim everything. Don't inflate the values, right? But claim everything. And if it's reasonable, the government probably won't test you on it. If they do, you have ways other than a receipt that you can prove it. And um, at worst, instead of just saying, oh, I'm beat, I won't submit anything that I don't have a receipt for, even if they knock one or two out saying, oh, we don't believe you on that, and say, well, I'm not going to fight you about a $4,000 dock that ends up being a $250 capital gain or something like that. Okay, great. Yes, we have another question. We, we kind of touched on this earlier, but I just want to reiterate again. What about like the property was worth so much and then when we build a home on it that's going to put the price of the property up so that's a capital improvement but it's also increasing the value of the home so am I going to be paying capital gains on that because I put a $700,000 structure on something that was worth three hundred dollars before I tore the old place down? If, you, gonna... if you put $700,000 into the property and that increases its value by 700000 you don't pay any tax. Really? If you put $700,000 into it and it increases the value of the property by a million, yeah. then you have a $300,000 capital gain. The point is, if it goes up by your 700000 if that drives the... It's, it's just the difference between your adjusted cost base and the fair market value. If they both go up on the same amount, it's not affecting your capital gains taxes. And some people have improved their cottages so much that the cost, the adjusted cost base is the same as or even greater than the fair market value. And that's an opportunity then to seize the day and transfer ownership to the kids while there is no capital gains tax. Okay, we have a question? I have one question. I have tons of bills from our cottage, the stuff that we did on our own. Can I just scan that in and keep it on a computer, or do I have to have paper and yeah. throw out all the paper? Yeah, yes, you can do that. Oh, and don't be the one that tries to say, oh, I don't think this one counts. Keep everything. Let the accountant decide. Capital improvement, capital improvement, maintenance, repair, capital improvement. You've got nothing to lose by uh, having the accountant go through things and decide what should be submitted and what shouldn't be submitted. There may be some things that you thought were of value that actually there won't, and there will almost certainly be some things that they said, oh no, this one counts. Okay, yes, we have a, another question. Opposite side of the room. I'll be right there. Okay, so I've saved all my receipts, which adds up to $100,000. I've done all my own work, which saved me another $100,000, but it raised the value of the home $200,000. So is there any kind of gain or help for me to claim the $100,000 that I saved by not contracting it out? Well, Canada Revenue Agency will gladly credit you $200,000 for the nails on the boards, and they will give you no value whatsoever for your hard labor, then that's just a built-in thing. Uh, it's not fair, it's not right. You can kind of understand it, you know. If I said, yes, I took, I get paid $200 an hour and I, I'm, I'm building a dock at $200 an hour, you can see why they don't want to consider it. So they've just arbitrarily said, not just there's a flat value or an average value, they say there's no value. So you, you should, you should get the neighbor to do your work and pay him, and then you do his work and he pays you back. Okay, so fair enough. So 
I'd almost be better off to not save any receipts at all and just say, well, look, the value of this home, if I would have somebody build it, is worth this much? Well, if you're saying what it's worth, they won't take your word for it. You need an appraisal or a realtor's opinion of value or something. They need some, some evidence that isn't me or you. What happens after the 21 years of that sprinkling? Uh... Okay, so good question. There's three choices at that point. Choice one, ideally, uh, here are grandchildren and they're responsible and they're adults, so we'll bring the cottage out into their name. Zero capital gains taxes. Choice two, but I don't have any kids, so I'll bring it out into my